Today we are very lucky here on The Voice Choice to have the Discovery Channel voice of How's It Made joining us. And we welcome to the show, Brooks Moore. Hey, Brooks. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Before we get into the mechanics of everything, let's take a look at the show. In an industrial mixer, a worker pours gelatin capsules over potassium chlorate. Gelatin serves as a binder for the match head compound. The worker adds hot water before he starts the mixer to dissolve the gelatin, which combines itself with the potassium powder. The worker then adds silica granules, which act as a combustion controlling agent. He rinses the sides of the mixer with water as the compound mixture reduces. After about 40 minutes, when the mixture is liquid, the worker adds red coloring, as well as other compounds that make the match head burn more vigorously. On the splint production line, a worker inspects a batch of splintered aspen wood, impregnated with ammonium phosphate to prevent afterglow. The splints run over perforated plates to shake off any residue or waste. Then they go through a machine which automatically discards broken or undersized splints. The splints now reach the match dipping line, where the perforated steel match bar runs down an endless chain. Tomato ketchup recipes vary only slightly, as consumers expect a certain familiar tomatoey taste. This U.S. company produces all-natural ketchup, made entirely of certified organic ingredients. Tomato paste agave nectar, a natural sweetener, onion powder, spices, salt, and white vinegar. The tomato paste, not surprisingly, is the base ingredient. It arrives at the plant in huge bins, which have been vacuum packed to preserve freshness. After unsealing each bin, the factory's quality control technician scoops a sample for testing. This is to make sure that the thickness is just right. If the sample gets the OK, workers slide the bin under a powerful air-driven pump. Then they flip a switch, and the pump begins moving the tomato paste to a large holding tank, transferring nearly 310 pounds of this ketchup base in less than 10 minutes. So, you're the guy that does that voice. How did you get into doing How's It Made? Well, it's interesting. I was kind of at the right place at a good time, and I took a little bit of initiative to make something happen. So um, I had done voice work, uh, started announcing horse shows, was on radio a little bit, and um, announced and, and did different things, small commercials and, stu and such. And I was uh, picking up a little extra work at Discovery Channel, producing and editing. And uh, there was a really great guy who was there by the name of Steve Burns, who was working on a show with another editor. And the editors usually read what we call a scratch track. And they read the scratch track so that they can finesse the script. And then they bring in the real narrator just one time. So the editor said, hey, Brooks, you know, I know you do voice work. Why don't you read the scratch track for me? And I'd always been into sound and uh, had Pro Tools and such. So I mixed my voice in to the actual mix of the show with all the sound effects and music. Mm -hmm. And he played it back. And Steve's like, oh, I really like that voice. Who is that? And uh, Ryan said, hey, it's Brooks. And Steve said, well, I'd like to use Brooks. And he you know, saw me later that week and said, hey, I'd like to use you for another show. I already have someone picked out for this show, but I certainly would like to use you for other shows. So about a month later, I started uh, doing shows for Discovery Channel. The first one was um, the old Monitor and Mary Mac from the Civil War, and it was about the bringing up of the turret for the Monitor. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get into that particular universally respected brand how, how many years from the day you started in sound until you busted into this boy that's a long time i mean i 
kind of started working there uh, in voice work around 2003 sometime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had been um, doing many things and commercials and small stuff up until that time. But in, in, in as far as really kind of being the voice of a show, that happened really kind of late 2004. So I was on a bunch of different shows, one hour specials, typically documentaries uh, that Discovery aired. And then uh, Steve said, hey, we have this little show from Canada. It's real simple. It's called How It's Made. And um, we're going to try it out in the U.S. And, and see how it is. And, you know, the show has been copied a million different ways from Sunday. People have had been uh, put additional money into trying to do something with hosts and different, different things. Maybe one uh, segment has... Uh, one topic kind of thing so it's just a simple show that is just really loved and it's lasted and it's outlasted really all of those other copycats that saw that how it's made was a good formula but it was a good formula in in what it did and it consistently would show you four episodes per half hour each one about you know five minutes and uh, it just really worked. So that's uh, how it started and how I've been doing since. Now, one of the things about me, I've always um, loved production and television and film and, and that kind of stuff. So in addition to voice work, I also direct and edit and, and shoot some. So I really um, wasn't full time in the voice field, but... Um, it's interesting, you know, once I started on How It's Made, I had some agents contact me in New York and L.A. and and presented some different work opportunities. And I was on a, a daytime uh, judge, like kind of like a Judge Judy show. It was called Judge Faith. That was a daytime, five days a week. I remember it. Um, piece. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it just it's led to other things. And um, it's been really wonderful because... It's amazing how many people have seen it. You know, you don't, people don't see your face. They just hear your voice. And I've had people just talk to me and like, you know, oh, you sound familiar. You know, and they'll, they'll just bring up different yeah. things. But if I, if I say something like, hey, you know, or they say, what do you do? Well, you know, one of the things I do is I, I direct and, and produce and, but I also do, uh, narration for the TV show, How It's Made. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, How It's Made. So it's amazing how many people have watched it over the years and have been fans. Why do you think that, that it is so oh. beloved? And you know, it really is. Well, I think one of the things that I am told a lot, and I have a lot of people write in and let me know things such as, hey, you know, when I was like 13, I was going through a really tough time. My parents were getting divorced and I could just kind of like come home and watch that show and just kind of get engrossed in how something is made. And I just really appreciated your voice and how you narrated it and the different topics that were covered. So it was really like a therapeutic thing is what kind of one person said. Another father said, you know, I really had a great time sitting with my children and watching the show. So I think one of the other neat aspects of it is that the show is for all ages in a way. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, people that are maybe in their 20s now or 30s, uh, they'll say, oh, I watched that when I was younger and I still see it. And, you know, people that are into science and technology, you know, it's just like they're bound to have uh, have seen the show sometime and, and then, you know, watch it with their kids because... It's just a great show, and it's uh, nothing crazy, nothing bad for children. It's just a really good, wholesome show. And you sound exactly like the show, which is so different for many narrators who do not. They use a different voice. They push their diaphragm. They do something to make themselves sound the way that you naturally do. Were you always able to use your voice the voice that you were born with, the way that you do on how it's made? I think so. I think, you know, one of the things that I found is what I try to do when I'm tasked with narrating something is what is the purpose of 
what I'm doing for narration? Is it for television? Is it for a corporate piece? Is it to describe how a product is made? And, you know, so there's many, many different um, areas that it could be used for. And then there's like a documentary style. And, and I think that although I don't want to say that uh, the voice is Brooks, okay, but Brooks can give you a more serious read and describe something that is a very serious topic. So, you know, you can kind of bring it up, move it around. Uh, I did uh, How It's Made Dream Cars. And for mm -hmm. that, uh, series, I'd bring it up a little bit. It's the How It's Made, but it's like today on How It's Made Dream Cars, you know, the Porsche 911 or something of that sort. So, you know, I added a little bit more excitement to that aspect, but, you know, kept the feel of How It's Made. So I think that, you know, voice people kind of take a look at what they're doing and what's needed and really try to deliver the message clearly and with emotion, that's going to help whether it's a television show explain something or whether it's a commercial product that, you know, they want to have people see and, and potentially buy. So I think you have to really think about what it is that's going to be something is used for. And a lot of times I like to try to see, let's say, a scratch track or try to see the commercial or corporate piece before I narrate it. Sometimes I'll do a scratch and then I'll come back once it's done and I hear the music and everything together and I'll try to craft something exactly for that. But you don't get directed any longer, do you? It's pretty much you get hired and you become yourself, right? You, know, you don't have somebody taking your voice and trying to change it, right? It all depends. And I think that, um, you know, how it's made is such a... Uh, has been going on so long so you know it's like it's like kind of um you can do it while you're half asleep practically and it's the same thing but i've had people that have uh directed me i think i was really probably directed a lot on the uh judge uh show that i did and i've done some other things that people kind of um you know wanted a, a little different style read and and would mm -hmm. work on giving that to them um, it, it all depends, you know, on, on what someone is looking for. If they're looking for just that, then, you know, that's, that's easy. And I'm, I'm asked a lot of times to, um, you know, direct talent uh, for different commercials and things. And one of the things that I really try to do is I try to work with the talent and not direct them how I would say it, but how they would say it and how they would say it with the emotion that is needed to, you know, sell the product. So I don't try to change someone's voice when I'm someone's voice when I'm directing talent. I try to get the best out of them. Interesting uh, and original as a director. I I haven't heard that one before, but I think that it works really well. Um, in my early career, I always had people trying to change the way that I sounded. And from A to Z, the kind of freedom that you're suggesting isn't something that I have experienced that much in my whole career. Well, I think, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, okay, the client has clearly picked this person that they want to read, like, let's say this commercial, okay? And the person's reading the commercial and um, they might, let's say, kind of bring it up on the last word and maybe that just doesn't close it well so i might say can you bring that bring that down okay instead of bring it up but that's kind of like you know i don't try to like completely ch change their style because first of all they've been picked for out of a bunch of people in auditioning and the second thing is i don't I want to take what people have and try to make it better and help them polish it. That's that's how I look at it because everyone's unique and that's the thing about this business. You know, I might audition for so many different things and I might get some things I might not. And you know, the thing I always remember is it's not about me. It's not about I'm no good or boy, I wish I could be better. So certainly I do work 
with the coach at times and work on my skill set, but I don't take it when I don't get an audition or, or a piece, or I don't get a you know final on something. I don't take that as that I'm not any good. And you know, I I I will read for something for a client, and maybe they pick someone else. It's okay, you know. They pick what they feel is best. I've been picked for what they thought was I was the best for. So it just mm -hmm. can't get discouraged in a way. And I think it's important to keep keep trying and uh, listen to feedback uh, from people that you trust and respect. And I think working with a good coach um, is important because it helps you kind of expand your repertoire. And sometimes a coach can give you some suggestions on maybe an area that you seem to be a good fit for. Not everyone's a movie trailer voice. You know, True. that's just, we're not, you know, Everybody has their own uniqueness, and that's the beauty of it, is that we are unique, and no two people sound exactly the same. I sometimes will get people will say, hey, Brooks, did you narrate this? And if it's something I did, I'd say yes, and if it's something I didn't, I'd say, you know, no, I didn't. Well, it kind of sounds like you, but then I would go listen to it, and it's like, well, you know, you really keep, you know, there's, there's not a copycat of Brooks Moore. You know, Brooks is yeah. unique, and, and so are you unique. And, and everyone out there that does voice, you are unique, and people are going to want to work with you. Just keep working at it. Well, let's take a break right now for The Voice Shop in New York City, our sponsor. And when we come back, we will talk about uh, more with Brooks Moore and the importance of learning how to take that instruction. We'll be right back. The Voice Shop is a proud sponsor of the Voice Choice Vodcast, where you get to see and hear the inspirational talent behind the microphone. Shift your voice into high gear with professional training and coaching at The Voice Shop. You can save $20 off any purchase with promo code CHOICE at checkout. Visit us at voiceshopcoaching.com. So how important is education for people who are watching this and want so badly to become you, someone like you, or their own self? How important do you view the coaching process? Well, I think it's exceptionally important. And I have to say, you know, I've done um, so many seasons of How It's Made, so many episodes. And, you know, I'll work with the producer maybe for a couple of years, and then maybe there's a change, and that producer will go on to something else. But... I have the producers and, and they keep me grounded in a way. So sometimes you might slip in something that's maybe you mispronounce something or you have a, a certain word or something that sometimes you mess up, you know, they're on that and they will say, hey, can we redo that? Can we fix that? Or can you say this maybe a little bit differently? Uh, maybe it's a pronunciation of a name, so we might look that up and make sure that that particular object or whatever that we're talking about, that we say it right. Because people will write in and say, you didn't say this word right or you didn't say that right. So you try to do the best you can on that. I think one of the things about direction is that, um, and coaching, I think coaching is is really vital. And it's just like anything. We don't um, drive a car without getting a license. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't, True. you know, do, yeah. do certain things without education. And it's just as important to be educated in the field that you, you have a passion for. And I've had so many people reach out to me over the COVID time, like, hey, I'm thinking of picking up some extra work or doing a podcast. What do you recommend? And, you know, I, I recommend some equipment to them and, and some people have sent me their demo and I listen to it. But I, I tell them, you know, I think it's important that maybe you work with a coach that can help you uh, develop your best sound. So we all have different abilities with sound. As I said, we're not all, we're not all movie trailer people but we have a sweet spot and we might have a couple sweet spots. I really believe we probably do. 
But sometimes mm -hmm. you need sure. a coach to kind of help you see that because if we do something one way our entire life, we keep doing it the same way until we learn something different, either the hard way or someone teaches us. So one of the things that I found really helpful from uh, working with the coach is the variety of different projects that the coach um, has me work on. They might be projects that I never have worked on before. They might be uh, a commercial. Let's say I'm just reading a, a commercial for McDonald's or a commercial for Taco Bell or, or beer or something. So, you know, that's a different sound and a, and a different delivery than how it's made is. So, you know, the coach kind of helps you fine tune that and see what your sweet spot is. And, and I think the coach can be very helpful to say, hey, um, you know, I think you really have a talent in this particular area. You might want to look into this and look for this particular uh, type. You sound like you're a perfect fit for audiobooks. You know, people, when they hear you, they really engage with you and you have that emotional content and delivery in your voice that I think that would be a great fit for you. So those are really helpful. And, and sometimes the, the things that they think about, you've never thought about before. So I find that to be really helpful in working with um, voice coaches. I call that the aha moment when all of a sudden it occurs to you that your sweet spot has been discovered. Sure. And I, I, one more thing about the coaching thing. The other amazing thing about the coaching thing is you're typically working with a group of other people in the business or in the same area as you. So you have that opportunity to hear them maybe on the same script or the same type of script and hear other ideas, which, you know, if you're just kind of reading something yourself, you don't get that uh, because you're reading your copy. I'm not listening to uh the canadian voice that's doing how it's made i mean because i am the only american voice uh that does it in the u.s so i don't have a a reference point for that nor do i want to copy somebody else but you get ideas from other people and i think that's another great aspect of working with a coach excellent point Let's take a break right now with our sponsor, Shure Microphones, and we'll come back in a moment and continue our conversation with Brooks Moore. This segment of The Voice Choice is sponsored by Shure, and this is the voice of God. Actually, I'm not God at all. I'm Eric Holloway, a voice actor. And when I want to sound my very best, I depend on Shure Microphone. It delivers the sound I want. So, how am I doing? Brooks, are you surprised at the weird art of voiceover? How much more prevalent it is now in all of our professional lives than it was when you and I started in the business so long ago? Uh, it's amazing. And I think for people that want to be in the business, there's so much more opportunity now. And um, it's kind of like back in the day when we would edit films and, and video, it required such expense, you know, uh, to mm -hmm. do audio, you would need to go to a studio and um, they, you know, have a very expensive microphone, uh, audio board, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, speakers room, the whole nine yards. And, and not to say that's not good and does have use, okay? And especially the person behind the console that's also kind of directing you at times. But the entry bar to get into it, um, you know, my daughter was just doing some voice for uh, a piece and really just um, it was, it was more kind of like just, uh, talking. Okay. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, well, you know, you're, you're in another state. Uh, I mean, do you think you could get, um, one of these microphones and it happened to be a shore microphone, uh, that they make that 
can hook in for a USB connection for a podcast, or uh, it has an XLR connection to to hook into an audio board or or something like that. So, um, you know, it was uh, it's a good microphone. So it wasn't it wasn't fifty bucks. It was a couple hundred dollars, but it was well worth mm -hmm. it because it had that professional sound to it, and based on the um, seven series of their microphone, so. Uh, she sounded amazing, and uh, she was directed over a Zoom call. So uh, she recorded locally, but, you know, I think one of the things is now that people can, uh, there's so much more opportunity because there's so much more content. You know, podcasting has been going on a long time, um, like 25 years probably. I remember when Apple first came out with that, I did a couple podcasts and registered mm -hmm. them with them and had a site and things like that and had all these ideas about podcasts I was going to do. And, you know, I got busy and didn't really do that. But now, you know, everybody, every business is looking to do a podcast. Content experts are looking to do co uh, podcasts. So where's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is you need a good host to walk you through that podcast. You need a good voice to take us and bridge us through all the different sections of the podcast, introduce the people and such. So there's, as well as obviously make the podcast. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for people that really want to get into this business now because the barrier to entry is a lot less and there's so much more need for different things. There's audition sites now. Instead of having an agent, which is great to have an agent, but you can also pick up auditions online through services that you True. can subscribe to. Yeah. So, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity now for voice people uh, to one, if, who want to get in the business to be a part of it. And you're also, besides voiceover, you're in the production company business. What's that business like for you because you were once originating in voice? What, what is that business about that you're doing? It's quite an operation, I do believe. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I look at it much like I look at doing something for your voice. And that is, someone comes to you with a script and they want you to narrate it. What are you going to bring to that? How are you going to help deliver that to make it effective to, if they're trying to sell something, engage with the audience so that they feel that connection. So we've always said that sound is the number one element to a project. And that's the first thing that we hear. We can forgive bad video, but we don't forgive bad sound. So in delivering a great sound, we're also helping that client with whatever need they have to solve. So in the video realm, we do the same thing. We sit down with a client. They say, you know, we have this problem. The problem is we're having trouble reaching people about COVID vaccine, uh, getting vaccinated. You know, we're not sure mm -hmm. what's the best way to do that. So, you know, we sit with them and, and strategize and, and, you know, throw out some ideas and come up with ways to help the client, whether it's for a commercial, whether it's the airport that's nearby, wanting to get more passengers in and show what a friendly place it is. It's all these different challenges that we look at as a challenge and how can we help them solve it? And, and it, I would say it started with the audio aspect and thinking about it from an audio aspect. Even, it's interesting, even announcing a horse show. What's involved with announcing a horse show? Well, as a person who sends the horses in the ring, they're announcing, okay, uh, two, three, five, you're next to go. And then I have this person who's gonna be after that. And then after that, and you read out the lineup of the next four contestants. So you're giving those four contestants direction that they're going to be going into the ring within a couple minutes. You know, one maybe in two mm -hmm. minutes, one in four, one in six. 
So you're kind of like directing people. And that's what you do with your voice. You're directing people to engage with the visual. And from a visual standpoint, we add that element to the sound and create a product that helps people to engage, the audience engage with what's being shown to them. Brooks, thank you so much for doing this today and for joining us here on The Voice Choice. Uh, I've listened to you for uh, 15 years that I can recall. Uh, I know that sometimes the big voice doesn't have time for the startup podcast, so I appreciate you having time for us today. It's my pleasure, and um, I have to say that, you know, one of the great things about this business is the beautiful thing is the people are the ones that make you, and the people True. that are fans that have keep watching the show, the people that write in. So I try to give back to people that ask me, hey, can you share a little bit about your story? Uh, I think it's someone gave me an opportunity and I'll never forget that. And I will always give others opportunity like I was given. Well, thank you so much, Brooks, uh, for sharing your story and your heart, your journey. And uh, we, uh, all of us here in the studio, very much appreciate it. And we will be listening to you on the Discovery Channel and other places. Thank you so much. Thank you.